Thank you very much. Uh, I want to say thank you to the rain. For those, uh, for me or anyone else here from California, you know that rain is not that abundant in our lives right now. In fact, this year was very, very scarce. And so uh, my, I can just feel my skin opening up, the pores are saying, oh, moisture. So usually the first rain that comes sometime mid-September to the end of September, I just go out and stand in it. So, um, so I do really appreciate that I got a little rain just a few hours before I head back to California. <laughs> they would love that. Well, actually, it's always a little weird when we get rain in the middle of summer because we're so not used to it. We're not really prepared. So um, I just want to say thank you to Seed Savers Exchange. This is like coming to Mecca for me. Um, and I do want to bow down, say thank you so much for the work Seed Savers Exchange has done, both in inspiring me and getting me into seed in the beginning and being there all along and continuing to grow and expand and be just amazing in what they do. And I don't quite understand why I'm here on the stage. I'm more, I'm just a gardener. Uh, so it feels a little odd and yet it feels really exciting at the same time. And um, so just really, really wanna thank everyone at Seed Savers Exchange for the work they've done and. Uh, keeping this going and keeping this movement going and being really the inspiration for the movement that I'm going to talk about. So um, this is a mem kind of a member story. So it's different than what I did yesterday because I'm going to focus a little bit more on my path and then get into some of the community seed movement. Um, and just to let you know, uh, she mentioned those things that I did help co-found the West County Community Seed Exchange. I work with Seed Matters, which is an organization um, that's coming out of the Cliff Bar Family Foundation. Cliff Bar are those energy bars um, that are all over. And they have a really strong commitment to sustainable food systems and happened to hear a talk a few years ago uh, by Matthew Dillon, who was at the Organic Seed Alliance, and realized that there was a really big missing piece to the whole sustainable food movement and that no one was really talking about seed that most organic farmers weren't even able to get organic seed, and so they made a commitment to start an initiative called Seed Matters. So it's coming out of the Cliff Bar Family Foundation, and it's a project that is mostly focused at um, a different level than many of us here, in that it's, they give fellowships to graduate students to do organic seed breeding. And so it's kind of hand in hand with some of the stuff we've been hearing over the weekend, is that you know, no one is really doing seed breeding for us and for small farmers and for organics. And so they've been giving fellowships to graduate students in ag schools around the country. They also uh, work with Organic Seed Alliance to do the Farm, stu uh, farm Seed Stewardship Program, um, which is really bringing farmers into the breeding process and working on improving seed for their specific needs. And so the project that I came in on was the Community Seed Toolkit campaign, and um, it was a way to get everyday people involved with seed. And so I was really lucky to get involved with that and I'll talk a lot more about that. But really I'm just a gardener and I've been gardening, I've been blessed to garden um, as, uh, for my, as basically a way to make my money for most of my adult life. I've been running big, large scale um, educational gardens in Northern California for almost 20 years, um, have hopped around from different ones, um, not been in the same place for more than seven years. Um, and the first big project I got into was in a little retreat center up in Mendocino County and I ran a one acre garden there and we did educational programs and grew food for the kitchen and we started doing a lot of teaching and I was really excited about full circle gardening and compost and kind of getting people to think bigger than planting in the spring and harvesting in the fall and, um, but hadn't done any seed saving and went down to the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, which if you've never been, if you ever come to California and you want to see one of the most amazing gardens uh, in Northern California or on the planet, you should visit the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center. And it, it's a truly amazing garden. They call it the Mother Garden, the Center of Diversity, and they do extensive seed saving. They have thousands of varieties, and then they get their seed out into the community and to people all around. But I went and visited there in um, the early 90s and was talking to Doug Gosling, who's the head gardener there, who has been my mentor and uh, friend for that many, many years. 
And he started talking about seed saving, and I had never really ever heard of it or thought about it much, which was weird. If you're a gardener, you think you'd immediately know about it. But let me tell you, because I teach gardeners all the time about growing food that most don't think about seed saving. And so I had this, oh, wow, that sounds kind of cool. That's kind of fitting into my whole vision of the whole idea of full circle, uh, growing something, bringing it back the next year, adaptation. I loved all those ideas. So I was like, okay. So I went home and I noticed some of my arugula had gone to seed or was bolting. And usually I would pull it at that point. And I thought, well, let's try it. Let's, let's get into this. And so arugula was my first seed. I always love to ask people, what was your first seed? Um, <laughs> You know, and it's kind of cool watching it grow and trying to figure out when it's dry enough. And then I cut it all and I put it in a bag, and that was it was fine. And then I got some bowls out one afternoon and started cleaning it, and uh, started kind of getting it all down to just the, the seed and getting the husks out and pouring it back and forth. And I had this moment, and uh, I get a little emotional because it really was a moment of. Um, I feel like I found there was a cellular memory came through me of this is what my great great grandmothers did, or somewhere in my body, I knew that I was supposed to be connected to seed, and um, it was just like, oh, wow. So <laughs> I do, uh, I, I I love seed, and it really was. I can remember that, you know, the pouring of the seed from the bowl to bowl. I didn't have screens yet watching the chaff blow away, and then running my hands through the bowl. Yeah. And, um, and it hooked me <laughs> forever. And, um, and it hooks other people. And I want to just share from that moment, I want to remind us all, because uh, we were talking about in the other, on Friday, we were talking about how do we get more people into this. And someone said, you know, it's really important people to people connections, I think. Um, I remember someone was saying, we, we got to talk to people. It's people to people that make it happen. And I agree with that. But really, it's people to seed. And I want to encourage you, anyone who's a seed saver, to do public seed saving. Go to the farmer's market and put down a sheet and pull out your bowls and let people touch it. Because um, that's the way I find that they get hooked on a really deep level. And they're going to make the commitment we, we all committed to last night because of that feeling they have. And um, they can hear about it, and they can be you know, into the idea of, oh, preserving genetic diversity, the importance of you know, keeping the seed from being controlled by multinational corporations, and all those ideas. But really what gets us, what gets us hooked, and gets us coming back here year after year, all you crazies that are doing that, um, is that, I think, that deep heart connection to seed. So um, just really get people touching seed. Um, I, I work with teenagers uh, in my garden. I have a garden program where I work with youth, and um, I see that. I, we don't do tons of seed saving, but we always do some. And I often will just go, okay, this is how you do it. Here's some bowls, here's some screens, just try to figure it out. And then I just leave them with a big sheet so you know we don't lose it all. And uh, last year, I remember these two young, they were about 15, and um, they, I called them the gossip girls. They were just always chatting, 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 and didn't really seem to care that much about the garden, and I kept trying to find ways to get them involved, and I was like, okay, here's this uh, spigriello. Uh, it's a leaf broccoli. It's this kind of cool crop that we're getting into in Northern California. Anyways, I gave them all this seed, and um, they were there a long time, and but they were really into it, and I walk over, and I just saw them with their hands just going through it, going through it. And um, it was the most kind of focus I'd ever seen them in the garden. And so just that, always give, give the seed, especially to the young people, especially to the little kids. I often will bring my old seed, the seed that I don't really care about, like sometimes the extras, I often only will harvest the center heads of carrot, so I'll bring the secondary heads, and I'll just give them to the little ones to play with. And um, they just get so into it, running it over the screen, seeing what falls through. And then they get it. They're like, ooh, I want to do this. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, just a little kind of on my path. Um, I was also an activist. I believe in activating, getting people in the streets or getting people together, saying yes to things and saying no to things. And I was in a kind of a no stage, no to war, no to a bunch of stuff and was feeling really disempowered. And um, 
So I thought, well, maybe I should do some more local organizing. And just as I was thinking that, I was living in Mendocino County, they decided to, a bunch of people decided to put together a ban on growing GMO crops in Mendocino County, uh, Measure H. And I thought, well, I can get behind that. And I got involved. And um, Monsanto got involved. <laughs> the big six got involved, actually. Pumped millions of dollars trying to stop this from happening because we were one of the very first counties to look at doing this. And, um, you know, it was like us and Goliath. You know, we were just like, ooh, how are we going to you know, fight this, this is going to be impossible. There are just, you know, every day a flyer coming in the mail about why we were, the, this ban was going to be bad. And, but we won. It was like the, <laughs> and it was the only thing I'd ever done that we had won. I was used to just being defeated. And um, so I was like, wow, I like this local organizing. Because um, I could talk to people, I could talk to all of my neighbors, and I could get them to understand what my concerns were, and we could have a conversation. And so I decided to start doing more local organizing, and I focused in on local food issues. And um, it was when no one had heard of food sheds. We we started the Anderson Valley Food Shed Committee, and we're like, we had a long debate: should we use that word? No one's really heard of it. It's not really a word in the. But we're like, let's let's just put it out there. Maybe it will take off. And it took off, and we were you know, in, in this incredible movement that took over the nation of local food, local food, where's your food come from? And it was really exciting to see and have people really care about where their food came from. At the same time I was doing that, I still had this closet of seed, because I was still saving seed. And we had a once a year seed swap, and some of it would go out with that. And I was a member of Seed Savers Exchange, and I'd get a couple orders, and some would go without. And then every year I'd have to go through and compost a bunch of my seed, so I was kind of doing these side by side, and you know the seed swap was great. It was a good way to get seed out, but it just still felt like, wow, uh, the seed is abundant, and I'm not doing enough with it. And just to let you know, really what I want to call this talk is out of the closets, into the libraries, no more old jars of seed. Um, so <laughs> just get out of those closets, everyone. Um, <laughs> so... I moved down to Sonoma County and um, started getting involved with a community group called Transition Sebastopol. And we had this 200-person meeting to look at how to create a more resilient and sustainable community. And there was this subgroup focused on food. And um, we were looking at all the ways we can support a healthier, more sustainable, vibrant local food system. Um, and a couple of us were like, well, what about seed? Any, you know, and people are like, what do you mean? And we're like, you guys know, right, that most seed comes from far off and seed comes from many you know, sources of which many aren't great. And um, we really don't have much control of the seed industry and it's being taken over by the big giants. And where people are like, oh, that's, a, that's something we should put on the list. Let's do something about that. And the th three of us who were seed savers and gardeners said, no, let's do something now. And we pulled off in a subgroup and we said, we're going to start a seed bank. And uh, I'm kind of a doer. I'm not a talker. I'm not really a big planner. I just like to dive in. And so I was like, well, let's start next month because it was April. It was end of March. And I thought, well, if we don't do it soon. It will be, you know, silly to do it this year. So we just did it. And we, those of us who had seed, brought it all together. And we, we decided to have a one, once a month gathering to share seed and that we would create a repository of locally grown seed. Um, so... That's important. That's, you know, those are the things that are kind of different between seed swaps, which is just people bringing their seed and then taking it home, and maybe something like Seed Savers Exchange, where you're sharing with the people all over the country. We were like, we want locally grown seed, and we want to um, create a repository where there's this library, this bank, where people can come and get seed. So um, we started it in a school, at a school garden project, and we had monthly meetings where we had taught seed saving and offered our seed and had a really good response. We had 25, 30 people every month would come and look through the seed and learn about seed saving. And the idea was it was like a seed library. You would get the seed, check out the seed, and then you would have to return some. That was the idea behind the library movement is that it's you know maybe a year and a half later that you're returning something, but you are. But we just weren't getting that much return, and we kept thinking, well, how do we get more seed and better quality seed? And so um, we came up with the idea of starting a seed garden, a community seed garden, basically a garden that would be just to grow seed for our community. 
and found a church that had a big lot that wasn't doing anything, and they offered it to us when we well we off, we asked if we could garden there, and they also offered offered us a room in their church where we could store our seed, and we were able to kind of settle in even deeper, and now we have a quarter acre garden. Um, it's about the size of this tent, a little bigger than this, and um, no, it's quite a bit bigger, I guess. Um, and we only grow crops t- for seed there, and we grow crops that grow well in our area that we think would help, uh, we call calorie crops, would help us to really live off of our gardens if we needed to or wanted to. Um, crops that are really interesting to the area, maybe, like some old varieties that are um, related to our zone or place. So there's uh, the Petaluma gold rush bean, which is a new bean that, that's a very old bean. Um, that people are excited about. Um, we're doing bodega red potato. Uh, and then whatever anyone gets excited about and wants to grow. So um, we have this great project now where we have a seed garden, which where we can teach seed saving. We have a seed bank where anyone can come and check out seed and get seed free. It's completely free. And um, we teach seed saving and offer classes on gardening and also give out seed at events just to get seed out into the community. So that was my beginning, and that's the project that I'm really most excited about. Um, it feels really true to my heart. It feels like it was a long time looking for some other seed heads that would want to commit that much mm-hmm. to doing a project like this. And so um, when we started this, I knew of five other projects like this, and the re- how I knew about being able to start this is I had heard about some in the Bay Area, and... Um, I thought, oh, wow, that's cool. Let's all get together. And so there was a little, we had a little seed summit with about six of us who were doing, six or seven of us who were beginning to start these community seed libraries or seed banks. And we really didn't know of anyone else in the country doing it. Um, And we were like, well, let's, you know, let's see if we can get the word out and start supporting each other and figuring out systems. There's all these systems around databases and how do you, control quality and how do you take seed in and how, what kind of information you need and how do we share some of those so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And, um, and it was felt like, oh, this is really exciting. There's six of us. Woohoo! Uh, the Bay Area, Northern California. We're going to just transform the seed world. Um, and at that point is w- when I reconnected with Matthew Dillon, who Matthew Dillon um, was... The, I taught him seed saving. He um, showed up as an intern in this garden I had in Northern California, and he had never gardened before, and he was a, I think he did um, antique auctions or something, he was, and he was wanting a change in life. And he came and worked with me for six months, and this was in the mid-90s. He spoke here last year. Um, and, you know, you o- never really know who's going to do what with what you teach. And this is something I want to remind everyone, that you just never know where it's going to go. And um, who would know that he would mosey his way up after he left me um, to Port Townsend and kind of get involved with the Abundant Life Seed Foundation, kind of somehow work his way up to director of the Abundant Life Seed Foundation. (laughs) And then when it burned down and they were re-envisioning what they were going to do, he started the Organic Seed Alliance and um, is now one of the main, you know, a major player in the whole seed movement um, and then has moved to Cliff Bar Family Foundation and has started Seed Matters. And um, he, I taught him seed saving. I gave him that bowl. So um, I just want to remind you that you never, everybody that you get into seed saving, no matter, you don't know where they're going to go, and it, all of it is important. So I reconnected with him, and um, he started hearing about what we were doing, and he thought, thought well, that's kind of interesting. And we're at Seed Matters, we're doing all this work that just, you know, the scientists and graduate students and farmers are doing, but what, how do we get, they were kind of looking at how do we get people engaged in this movement, and how do we get more people involved. And so he invited me to join them with Seed Matters to help develop um, basically tool, a toolkit for creating community seed projects. So we have a series of how-to documents of how to start a seed library, how to organize a seed swap, and um, so I'm just trying to get it out there more in the community. And then we've been able to do a bunch of presentations and talks and such. Um, so what's happened, though, and this is what's part of why I'm here, is that from f- six years ago when we first organized this community seed bank in Sonoma County, and there was a group of us of six or seven in the area, 
Um, we know of about 125 to 140 community seed projects, seed libraries and seed banks across the country now. And um, it's kind of gone, as I was saying the other day, fungal. I say that instead of viral. Um, somehow it just took off, and I really feel like it was the right time, right place, um, right idea, everything coming together of, um, for a lot of reasons I'm going to get into, but uh, it seems to fit a need that people want, which is to come together as gardeners, to share seed, to promote food access, um, and to create more resilient communities, and to stand up and feel like we have some ability to reclaim seed from the the large multinational corporations. And so, you know, part of it happened is there was an, a piece on NPR about the um, basalt seed library in Colorado, and then there was a piece in the New York Times, and then it just, we were just getting all kinds of um, applications and people wanting to find out about how to do this. I want to just really acknowledge Richmond Grows, which is in Richmond, California, and they were the first seed library, actually put their seeds into a library. Uh, a public library downtown Richmond, and they have done incredible work at supporting other seed libraries, especially libraries in uh, in the libraries, um, go get getting going. And they've been they have incredible resources on their website, and they've been really leaders in this movement. And um, I just want to say, I think part of why it's really taken off in the libraries is I think there's three reasons why it fits so perfectly in our libraries. Is one. Libraries are our best democratic institution in this country. It's all you know, access to everyone. Um, it's about uh, being free. It's really about a sharing economy. And um, what's interesting is that they're struggling. Libraries are really struggling. Are there any librarians here? Just <laughs> and, uh, as people are moving away from books. And um, they need ways to be, of, um, I think, to show their value in our communities and have other ways that bring people in. And um, seed is a great thing to have in the commons, just as a library is our commons. And so com having seed come into the library is just another way of bringing something else that should be of the commons um, and have it be very accessible. I also think it's great because um, books need dry, you know, locations, no, low moisture, and not a lot of bright light. And so some of the conditions work well with seed also. So it's, it's better than other places sometimes. Um, it's better than sometimes farm barns and farms where some seed libraries have popped up. So, um, so that's what's exciting is that these librarians and community groups are you know, a, approaching libraries, and there's all these libraries that are bringing seed into their... And so this, this seed library, seed uh, bank movement is really about getting seed in places that is accessible to people. And so it's all over, but libraries are the basis of it. Um, I want to just talk a little bit more about why I think this community seed movement is just really um, the hot thing right now in this very small world we are circling in. Um, and I want to define what I think community seed, a community seed project is. Um, it's grassroots, and it's community-based, so that's kind of what differs it from Seed Savers Exchange, is it's really about local, neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor sharing. Um, it's non-commercial, so there may be member fees involved with some of these projects, but it's about seed being free, and maybe free as in beer. <laughs> I kept thinking about free as in beer, what was he talking about? Um, but it's, it's a non-commercial. There's incredibly great small seed companies popping up all over the country. Um, it's, there's been a kind of regeneration in the small-scale seed world, I think, in reaction to the takeover of many of our seed companies. Um, but that's not what I'm talking about. Those are great, and we want to support them, and we want to be engaged with them. But um, we're talking about the non-commercial approach to seed. Um, and it really is basically the growing, gathering, and sharing of locally grown seed. Um, and so there are seed swaps. I, these are the things I define as community seed projects. Seed swaps, seed banks, seed libraries, seed exchanges, sometimes people call them that. Um, and then there's also the school gardens, the community gardens, the food banks that are all bringing seed into their community work. And that's what we're also hearing because we offer um, toolkits, we offer seed screens and all these tools that will help people set up um, community seed projects. 
And so I get to hear from projects all over the country. And it's food banks that want to offer seed, not just um, food from their garden. They want to offer seed so people can have access to in the ability to grow food in their own gardens. And it's school gardens that want to get kids really growing seed and have a little seed exchange in their um, school. Or it's community gardens that want to kind of network a whole series of community gardens to grow seed and share them. And um, so it's, mo it's, it's pretty broad, and it's really pretty exciting. Um, and they're everywhere. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm trying to do a different talk than yesterday. I listed yesterday lots of the places they were in, but they really are from Alaska to Florida um, and uh, west to east also. We have a map on our website that just shows the ones that we've actually given toolkits to, which is a small subset, and they're all over the country. And uh, they're very small, and some of them are really big, and they're in little tiny towns, and they're in urban centers. Uh, they're in Esther, Alaska, which I always have to talk about because I just think it's so exciting that there's a, a seed library in Alaska that's committed to growing biodiversity. And, um, you know, it's just not where you'd pop think of a, a seed, seed project popping up. Um, so uh, it really is a movement, and it's, um, and it's a movement about abundance. And... Um, that's one of the things I think is most exciting about the movement is that it's not about scarcity and it's not about a big no, you know, we don't want this. It's about, wow, there's more than enough and we're going to share it. And I think the seed is really calling us to do that. You know, this, this, these old jars of seed, uh, you know, you just get way too much seed. If you start growing the right population size, which most of us won't or don't, um, but if you actually make a commitment to growing some population sizes that will give you really good quality seed, which is what we're trying to do with the, our, in our seed garden, you get gallons and gallons of seed. And um, it's really silly to seed save and not do community organizing and get it out into your community. It's really just a waste, if you ask me. Not a waste, because it's important to grow it and save it and you know, keep it going. But it's like so much wasted resources. We grew uh, a beet last year. And we decided to do, I think we ended up doing about 50 plants. So we did it, we planted it, you know, two and a half years ago. And um, we, we decided let's do, you know, let's start doing more biennials because, boy, biennials are a real commitment and very few home gardeners are going to do it. So let's start trying them and doing more and more of the really hard crops. So we did beets and um, we did this one that Alan Capular developed out of pea seeds. And um, I had them here. I was offering them... Uh, Anyways, we did 50 plants, which is even a small population, um, and took them out in the winter and evaluated them. And so we had like 80, and then we went down to 50, planted the best and the uh, the best back in. And I don't know how many of you have seen beets when they go to seed, but um, you know they're bigger than this thing. They they grow all over. They probably produce 10,000 seeds a plant. They're crazy. That's one thing I always tell people when I teach seed saving. You have to think about how this is going to look when it goes into seed, and it's going to need a lot more room, <laughs> especially some of those crops. So anyways, we have these giant, crazy plants that we didn't even harvest all the seed, and we have three gallons of beet seed. And um, so we basically have enough beet seed for all of Sonoma County to grow beets. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so for now it's just an issue of how do we get it out? How do we get it out? How do we get it out? Um, and, uh, but it's just, that's the gift of abundance, is it's about sharing, um, and it's about, and I think that that's what's really calling forth this movement, is that deep, uh, the, I think people enjoy sharing. I think people l like stepping out of scarcity. We have a world that's been very um, focused on scarcity, that there's not enough, that we have to take care of just ourselves, um, that the world is falling apart, and to actually have something that is a, you can give to others that can be based on a sense of enough is, um, I think, a, a really amazing thing to offer to your community and to, to the world. Um, there, there's enough seed if we grow it. So, uh, but we have to grow it. No one else is growing it for us. Um, so that's, that's, that's my call to you. Um, is to find some plant that you love. It's best to start with ones you love because you don't want three gallons of something you don't like. Um, 
and and just grow one thing and then share it with everyone you know or start a seed swap or start a seed uh, seed bank start a seed library gather your allies there's so many people who want to have a way to talk to other gardeners who want to talk about varieties who want to have a source of seed they feel good about talk to your garden clubs and your Grange members, you know, and I was just talking to someone, did you know the Grange in California is having a resurgence and we're like radicalizing the Grange? And um, you guys could do that also. Um, Granges are needing new energy and we have basically started a sustainable Grange movement and that's where we host our seed swap and we do, there's classes there and, um, what's a Grange? Where, who, who, oh, you must be urban. Are you an urban person? The Grange movement was started uh, in rural communities across the country to basically um, fight the train monopolies, my understanding. And it was an organization to support sustainable, basically keeping rural communities whole and healthy and sustainable. And the idea was to come together and support each other both. They had insurance when, there was, when, when they started having health insurance. They offered health insurance to all the members. It was a, very much a farmer-based gathering, kind of like a lion's club. Um, and they have buildings all across the country that are falling apart all over the world, and I mean all over the country. Um, and very most of the members, you know, are older, and there's there is a a lot of them wondering what they're going to do. And so there's a there's a place there for us to step in, um, partially because of their rural roots and people who are into agriculture and gardening. Um, so I just want to say that there are some issues with this community seed movement that I am painting as like, so glorious and beautiful. Um, there is a lot of crappy seed out there, um, which is a big issue that Seed Savers Exchange has had to deal with. You know, like, how do you know if this seed is any good? How do we know it's not crossed? How do we know how it was growing? How do we know there's not disease? Um, and so uh, one of the things is, and this is one of those things that I always struggle with when I'm teaching seed saving, is how do you just encourage people? Just go for it. Just let that arugula go to seed. Um, and how do you then say, okay, but you know what? There's actually some issues. <laughs> There's a lot of things you gotta understand and it's kind of complicated and you want some large populations and you have to be careful about everything that's growing anywhere near it and you need like 200 plants of corn and they all walk out the door when you say that. Um, so, it's this really tricky balance of how do you inspire people and get them excited and then kind of start pulling in the reins and say, well, you need to consider this and this and this. And so um, one of the things I've been really working with and trying to figure out how to do more with the community seed movement is how do we get some good protocols and how do we ensure quality seed? Because this movement's not going to go anywhere if you go in and you get some seed and you get this weird squash because the person saved their compost squash that was a cross of several things and recrossed again. And um, you know, it's not going to, they're not going to come back to your seed bank if they get seed that isn't what it was supposed to be or, you know, didn't really work for them. And so this is where I really feel like Seed Saver members, especially long term members who are serious seed savers, is we really need you in this movement, is we need experience, we need teachers. What's really fascinating about this movement is that it's been started by a lot of people who aren't seed savers. The first gathering of six or seven uh, community seed library people that I met with, none of them were serious seed savers. They were community organizers. They wanted food access. They wanted to get seeds out into the community. They had just asked a bunch of seed companies to give them donations. They were good seed companies, but, but they weren't they didn't know how they, and then they wanted to have pe seed come back, but they didn't even know how to teach seed saving at that point. They were just entering into the whole seed saving world. And there's this place for all of you who are seed savers to be our mentors in this movement and um, bring in this new generation of seed savers. And so we've been talking some with Seed Savers Exchange about how do we link the long term seed savers in this community, the Seed Saver Exchange Movement, to the community seed movement, and how do we bring that, that world t together because we desperately need more teachers um, so that we don't have poor quality seed and that people are understanding and we can regenerate that there's actually a community of people who understand how to save seed um, and just keep expanding that. Uh, so we're, we're hoping we can figure out how to do that. We really would love for people to consider themselves, think about being a mentor, look to see if there's a local 
organization working in your area. Don't be too snobby about your skills versus their amateurness, um, and just offer your offer your um, knowledge and see if there's a way that you can plug in and offer that old clo- all that cl- that closet of seed. <laughs> um, we have a couple old timers in our far- in our community who just don't want to let go of their seed, and we know they have tons of bean seeds, and. Um, We try to bring them in, we ask them to come speak, but they just won't bring them to the seed library. And, um, you know, just let go of it and keep the stuff you need and offer the rest away. So um, I just want to share one last thing. Um, I'm going to end a little early. Is um, I just want to honor my father. I'll cry again. Um, People are always like, where where did you start? How did it all begin? And... um, I have this crazy old professor father who, you know, now is getting really crazy with the hair coming out of his eyebrows and um, <laughs> believes in lots of wild things. And But he was this amazing gardener. And we didn't get to garden with him because it was his way of, I think, sa- staying sane. But I watched my lawn get torn up and there was all these weird berries that I had never seen anywhere else and never saw in the store. And... Um, started taking out the driveway because it was hot. So he dug up this big area along the driveway because the cement would be hot and so you could grow more melons. And, you know, there was just all these things happening all around. And I was like, well, you're kind of weird, Dad. But um, he was amazing. And um, somewhere in that, through osmosis, I got it. And, um, And he's given me a Seed Savers Exchange calendar every year for the last... I don't know how long, tell they, when they started making them, probably 15, 18 years ago. And um, but so he gifted me with this ability to dive into this, I think. And, and let me tell you, he would have never guessed when I was 17 that I would be here. <laughs> he had no hope for me. Uh, and so you just never know where anyone's going to go, including me. Um, so anyways, and I just want to also say that he's done this incredible work. He... Uh, got into quinoa in the early 80s when quinoa was just coming into this country, and he's been a quinoa breeder for 30 years now, and um, he thinks he's very alone out there. He has hundreds of things he's crossed and recrossed. If anyone wants to get into quinoa, he needs someone to take over his... It's like this. My back, The back room in my old house is like all those plastic jars over there of, um, of beans. He has hundreds of crosses of quinoa in our back area. Um, where I grew up. So anyways, I just really want to honor him because, uh, and he wished he could be here because he has come before to this conference, this camp out, but he's getting, that it's just too hard for him to travel. And so I just want to end with thanking him for, for that. So. <laughs> I just actually need to say one more thing. The reason why I talk about this is that I assume, and I, I just want to let you know that I assume this, is that all of you are going to get inspired and walk out of here and do something more. So I just want to put that out beyond um, what Gary did last night and your commitment um, to think about where can you take that commitment that you made last night. And uh, I want to just hope, I, I just want to put out that I hope you will do something in your community with that commitment and really take that commitment to seed out there. So... Thank you.